Hi, a very warm welcome to you all. I'm Fiona Israel, your facilitator for this Centre for Palliative Care 2022 annual lecture titled Past, Present and Possibilities, Using Evidence to Inform the Future of Volunteering Across Palliative Care. I am the Manager of Education and Training at the Centre for Palliative Care here in Melbourne, Australia, and I'm stepping in on behalf of our Director, Peter Hudson, who is unable to be with us. Before we proceed, Before we proceed with the um, session today, I wish to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today, the people of the Kulin Nations, and any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us today. I'd especially like to pay my respects to the Aboriginal elders past and present. They hold the memories and traditions, culture and hopes of Aboriginal Australia. Our guest speakers today are uh, uh, it's on your screen there. Um, the first speaker will be Professor Catherine Walsh. Catherine is a Professor of Palliative Care at the International Observatory on End of Life Care at Lancaster University in the United Kingdom. She is also Editor-in-Chief of the journal Palliative Medicine, which will be known to many of you. A nurse by background, Catherine's main research focus is on the way that palliative care is provided, especially in primary care and community settings and including broader roles such as those who are volunteers. Also with us to discuss volunteering is Heike Fleischmann. Heike is a highly skilled trainer and manager with over 10 years experience in, in the disability and palliative care sector. She joined the Palliative Care Victoria team in 2018 as the volunteer engagement and capacity building manager. Through her volunteering with her local hospital and the global organisation Zonta, she has become a strong advocate for the volunteering sector, for women, people with a disability and people experiencing homelessness. A touch of housekeeping before we get into the presentations today. Questions will be held over till the end. Uh, you'll see on your screen an ask a question icon. We, uh, if you could just tap away with your questions, we will be collating those in the background and we'll get to as many of them as we possibly can at the end. Um, there won't be any polls as far as I'm aware. So uh, just sit back and enjoy the wisdom of our facilitators and presenters. Thanks, Catherine. Thank you very much. And I'm absolutely delighted to be with you today, or as I say, uh, this morning for me here over in the UK. And I bring you very warm greetings from uh, my colleagues at Lancaster University in the International Observatory on End of Life Care. Um, and uh, just delighted to be talking today about something which I think is really important, volunteering in palliative care. So why do I think volunteering is important? And this is one of the reasons. I acknowledge this is UK data and the situation might be slightly different in Australia or whatever country that you come from. But we found quite a few years ago now that there were one and a half volunteers per paid member of staff more volunteers overall in the palliative care sector, specialist palliative care sector in the UK than there were paid members of staff. And these were people in lots of different roles, some of them direct patient facing, other in what I'm going to call back office functions like finance or fundraising. Some of them might be gardening, doing transport, running shops, a whole range of roles, but integral to the way that certainly in the UK, and we know from other data across the world, to the way that specialist palliative care and other palliative care services run. So one of the things I'm going to do today is to dig in a little bit more to some of the research that I and others have conducted to understand what's happening in the past, now and to think a little bit about the future. Now you'll see that I've got a little bit of a Beatles theme today, well-known song 
um, yesterday. Thankfully, I'm not going to be doing any uh, singing, but I'm sitting currently not too far away from Liverpool, the home of the Beatles. Um, and hopefully you'll just see why I've chosen some of this. Yesterday, very famous song, reminding us to look backwards, to remember. If you haven't seen this film actually based on yesterday, I do commend it. It's quite fun when everyone has forgotten the Beatles apart from one person. And we mustn't forget the past because the past is where we have come from and it influences where we are going in the future. So when I'm thinking about the past as a researcher, clearly there's only one thing that I do. I turn to systematic reviews because systematically constructed reviews of which there are some examples on the screen from myself and other authors are what brings the past together. These bring our yesterdays to today. And you can see that, I mean, there are far more reviews of volunteering research, but these are some of the ones which I would particularly commend that you have a look at. They are robust reviews looking at a range of literature in, this, in the sphere of volunteering. Now, I think one of the key recommendations from these reviews, as per pretty much every review I think you'll read, is actually there's a lot we don't know. But I tried to encapsulate a little about what we do know about volunteering from the evidence that we have so far. And what you can see here on the screen is my encapsulation of five different areas where the existing evidence has focused on. So the first thing we do know relatively well is something about the characteristics of people who typically volunteer. And this is global research, although I have to acknowledge that not all, but much of this research comes from high income companies, uh, countries, particularly the UK, Australia, America. But in those countries, volunteers are often female and it is an aging workforce. I have said before now that in the past, um, most volunteers would have looked like me, a grey haired middle aged lady whose children have grown up and who no longer works and has a lot of time to give. Uh, clearly, I fit two of those categories. I'm grey haired, middle aged and my children have grown up, but I don't have the time for volunteering anymore because I still work full time. And I think we're going to talk at some of that a little bit later. But we do know this from evidence. There's also a lot of evidence about the volunteer experience. And here I've categorised the typical findings in terms of what the experience is like for volunteers. So volunteers talk about the experience being flexible, informal, it's social. It's really important for some people to be a volunteer. It's an important part of their life and lifestyle. However, it can feel peripheral to the service that they are volunteering within. There are training needs, but also it can be very challenging. And here, one of the reviews that I was involved with actually looked at the emotional experiences of being a volunteer identifying that it is emotionally challenging as well, because these are people who are volunteering with people who are dying. And we have to acknowledge the challenge of that as we would acknowledge the challenge for those of us like myself who are healthcare professionals and across other paid roles. Some of the research dug into the volunteer role a little bit more, identifying that it was different to being a paid member of staff that it was often about being with or alongside people, mediating perhaps between the patient, the family and the paid staff, and sometimes a semi-professional role. Remember that many of our volunteers are highly qualified people in their own right, often bringing some of those professional skills to the volunteer role. There was another cohort, if you like, of research that focused on volunteer relationships. 
talking a little bit about boundaries, about some of their relationships with paid staff and the challenges of that, and some of the risks of being a volunteer. And again, one of my current PhD students is actually exploring some of these boundaries and relationships. So I'm looking forward to seeing some of that data when it comes out. And finally, and probably lesser than many of the others, we look at volunteer impact. Most of what we do know is about the satisfaction, both of volunteers and patients, family and staff. And then a little hint in one or two studies that having a volunteer might actually have an impact on survival. But one of the reasons I've covered colored that red, if you like, is that's where there's a beacon going saying, actually, where there is a real lack of evidence is understanding whether volunteers actually make a difference, which is a major challenge, I think, that we need to hold on to and think about. So going back to my um, Beatles theme, um, we've talked a little bit about yesterday and we're now going to talk about a little bit about today and thinking about some of the more recent research that might inform our thinking about tomorrow. So I've chosen for this uh, section of the talk to talk about some of my own research. Clearly it's work that I understand well and hopefully can bring alive a little bit more. So I'm gonna talk first about some work that we did about four or five years ago that actually did look at effect and effectiveness. So I've said this is a real lack in the whole cohort of studies around volunteering. So we were very privileged to be funded to actually do a study which actually explicitly looked at outcomes. So we were focusing on a particular form of volunteering which was befriending. So this was in-person befriending as a patient facing role, primarily in community and home settings. And we did this in the context of a wait list trial. So I'm not gonna talk about the methods of many of these studies in a lot of depth and detail, but for those of you who are interested, of course, I, you know, I've shown you the paper, which is open access, it's freely available. But essentially, we identified patients um, and randomized them to either receive a volunteer befriender immediately or to wait four weeks. So a highly pragmatic design that meant that everyone received a volunteer in the end, but some of them had to wait. And that was the difference between the intervention and the control condition. And we also did, as you can see in that arrow at the bottom, a huge amount of qualitative data collection as well. And I will focus on some of that a little bit. Although it was challenging, it was a really successful study in that we randomized a huge number of people for a volunteering home-based study into both the intervention and control arms of the trial. And we found a range of different things. The first thing I want to focus is actually the mean age. Now these clearly are not the participants in the study. Jay Leno and Princess Anne were not in our study. But these are people who are the age of those who are the typical age, 72. Slightly younger then than you typically find in a palliative care study. So, um, Interesting question there about the, the, you can see there's a quite a wide range, but the average age was around 72 of the people who were referred into the service. Some interesting questions there perhaps about how people were introducing uh, the concept of a befriending volunteer and potentially thinking about who might benefit because we know even when people end up in a trial, they've had a process to get there in the first place. It was much more likely that women took part in the study. Now, interestingly, 54% of those who were referred to the study were female, so it was pretty equal split, but 61% of females actually ended up being randomized. In other words, they agreed to participate in the study. So again, there's a little bit of a gender bias here creeping in, and we could think perhaps uh, or hypothesize about 
why that might be that perhaps women were more bought into a befriending type intervention, possibly even keener to take part in research. We don't have the answers to that. We can just see what was happening. Many of them did live alone, but not all of them. We actually thought the percentage of those living alone for a befriending uh, service might actually be higher. It's still relatively high, 56 percent. But many of the people actually did have somebody living alongside them. So the purpose of the befriending intervention was not necessarily about somebody who was alone or lonely, although that might be the case. But we did collect data on loneliness because we thought that might have been one of the outcomes of the service. Just under half of them had cancer. Now, actually, the services, when they saw these data, because we ran this across eight different services across um, England, were really surprised by this because actually, typically, the proportion of those that access their services, a higher proportion have cancer. And what they thought was happening was the befriending volunteer based service was actually what they're going to call a gateway service. It brought a wider variety of people into their services than typically would be referred. And they were actually very excited by that, that the befriending volunteering services that we were testing out seemed to bring in that wider range of people to open their services potentially to those who might not have received a service. And although we didn't collect data on this, anecdotally, many of them said, well, once they were then in our service, we then were able to refer them to other aspects of the service and felt that this actually enabled a higher quality of care overall, although we can't really comment on that. It was just an interesting aside. This is what we found, and I'm not expecting you to be able to necessarily interpret that diagram. So when we uh, did uh, some feedback to the volunteers we um, and to the services and also in some of our other information, we actually simplified it in a phrase because actually understanding what was happening in terms of this is quality of life data was actually quite challenging. But to summarise it, the measurable effect of our study was in reducing the speed of decline. In other words, the quality of life of pretty much everyone in our study was declining. These were people who were dying. Many of them died during the study. So these were not people necessarily in the early stages of their illness. They were quite ill and sick. So their quality of life and some of the other measures that we were tracking with them were going down. And if all you did was measure the quality of life of the people who were receiving a volunteer, you would think that it wasn't making a difference because the data were just going down. But of course, we had our control group, those who were waiting, and we could see that the decline in the control group was slower. So the effect of the volunteers on quality of life appeared to be in slowing that decline, whereas those who didn't have a volunteer had a more rapid decline in quality of life. And I actually think that's really important and also shows the power of a randomised control trial in being able to detect that difference where other study designs might not have been able to detect a difference. Now, it was a subtle difference and many of our other measures we didn't see a difference in. No difference in loneliness, no difference in social isolation, some difference in quality of life. So there are challenges as well in running these sorts of quantitative studies in actually detecting a difference. Not here to talk about research methods, but it is a really interesting question. We also found there was a difference depending on how much time the volunteer gave. Because we obviously collected a lot of data, including how long the volunteers were there for and how many times they were visiting. Because it was very pragmatic, although we have had some boundaries around it, there was a lot of flexibility as well. 
And we found that the more support that somebody received, the better the impact on the person. Now, we don't know whether that was because they were visiting more frequently or they had a longer time together at each contact, but it certainly gives a time effect. And actually, the volunteer coordinators running these services actually were quite excited by this data as well, because one of their key questions was, I have a finite number of volunteers, so do I spread them thinly or do I focus them in more intensive visiting to people who might benefit the most? And the answer from this is appears to be you might get a better ben benefit from focusing them more on people who might benefit a little bit more, which were typically those who are older and actually the men in the study than necessarily trying to spread your volunteers too thinly. As I've already said, we also did quite a lot of qualitative work alongside this. And again, this is uh, published and, and out there. And we did a lot of interviews with patients, with carers, with volunteers, with volunteer managers. So multiple perspectives in terms of how this uh, befriending was experienced by people. And people either were alongside or did for. There was quite a lot of doing for. I mean, I visited to interview a, a patient where the volunteer had actually redecorated their entire living room. So, I mean, you know, that was perhaps out at one end of the spectrum. But the thing that came through really clearly from this was actually what the patients themselves thought and what partly why it appeared to make a difference. And this was a typical quote which really exemplified what they were talking about. The volunteers, they don't have to do it. It's coming from the heart. They want to help other people and they don't want it for personal gain. And for the patients who had a volunteer supporting them, this was really important. The sense that somebody did it just because they wanted to do it for them. There was a real qualitative difference to their perception compared to, say, for example, and they talked a lot about, you know, the community nurses coming in or perhaps the other hospice services or the support from their general practitioner and other medical professionals. It wasn't that they didn't value those other services, but they felt differently about the volunteers. And again, I think that's a really important finding in terms of you know, what that tells us about volunteering. We encapsulated much of the evidence from that in actually uh, what we think is quite, a, you might disagree, <laughs> quite a user-friendly toolkit based on the evidence available to us. Now, of course, this is pre-COVID. We, we, we produced this in about 2017 or 2018. It's a PDF, which uh, the URL and the um, QR code are there. If you follow that link and input your details, you'll be emailed it directly as a PDF. So if anyone's interested in that, then you can uh, download it and hopefully it might be of some help um, in terms of thinking about the evidence based for volunteering. I'm going on now, though, to talk a little bit more about what's happening right now. And these are the two remaining beetles right now, a little older. And in fact, this is even a slightly older, even greyer, I think, than they are in this picture. And of course, what's happening right now is a global pandemic. So I want to talk a little bit now about some of the studies that we've done exploring some aspects of volunteering in the context of COVID-19, because that has made quite a fundamental difference and actually shifted, I think, some of the thinking about volunteering now and in the future. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is actually a study that we did right at the beginning of the pandemic. So I was involved with a, a group of researchers running what we called the COVPAL study. 
which looked at lots of different aspects of uh, palliative care provision during the early stages of the COVID-19 pandemic. And you can see uh, my colleagues there from a number of different universities across the UK who were part of that collaborative. And we studied all sorts of aspects, but because one of my interests, of course, is volunteers, when we sent out a survey right at the very beginning to try and map out some of this landscape, we added in some questions on volunteers so we could understand what was happening with volunteering. Now, this particular survey was worldwide, but it was quite UK focused in its response. So you can see that we did get a reasonable number of responses from the rest of Europe and what are called the rest of the world. But you can see here that the vast majority of the responses came from the UK. But actually, um, much of what was happening across the world was very similar to what was happening in the UK. So what we could see were there were lots of different types of services. So you could see here some of them were uh, publicly funded, some of them were privately funded, some of them were within the, the, the state system, etc. So again, um, I've colour coded this so you can see the UK, rest of Europe, rest of the world, etc. And we also divide it into low and high income countries. But actually, you can see that there were patterns here, we had roughly the same proportion of responses, irrespective of where in the world people had responded from. We asked them typically what volunteers did within their services. So they were answering this immediately pre-pandemic. And you can see here that nearly 60% of services had people in direct patient support roles, some of them in indirect support, that was often reception or refreshment making, back office fundraising, etc. But clearly that direct patient support was a very important role. And I think hold on to that, 60% of services, and this was about services answering the questionnaire, not individuals, they were answering it on behalf of their entire organisation, were working alongside volunteers, providing that direct patient support. This is what we found. What I would actually call a catastrophic decline in the number of volunteers. We collected these data in mid 2020. So right at the beginning of the pandemic, most of the responses came in in April, May, June of 2020. So this was clearly here in the UK, we were in our first lockdown um, and this clearly had a major effect. Nearly 80% said they had a much less use of volunteers and 9.8 slightly less use of volunteers, hence the very big downward arrow. This was a major decline in volunteering. And when you consider, as I've just said, that nearly 60% of those services had direct patient for, for, for facing volunteers or volunteers in really important um, functions such as you know, fundraising and finance, this actually had a major impact on these organizations. Now, some of it, of course, but actually less than you'd think would because most of our shops were closed and the volunteers were running charity shops to support some of the hospices in the hospice sector. But actually, the, the, the major decline was in those patient facing volunteers. So we asked a few questions about why and what was going on. So again, um, we looked at the change in volunteer deployment. And again, here you can see that data in even much more detail, much less. And that was the same across the, the world, basically. And that's why I've put that in. This is not a UK phenomenon. Although it was slightly more in the UK, 80%, you can still see 75% much less in Europe and 78% much less in our respondents from across the world. This is not a UK phenomenon. This appeared to be happening everywhere. Now, one of the main reasons this was happening 
was because the organizations told us that they wanted to protect their volunteers. Unsurprising, we were facing a global pandemic at the time, well pre-vaccinations, uh, with clearly a catastrophic effect on people and the use of healthcare services. So again, this was a typical response. Our volunteers are generally over 65, and there is a fear from their families of undue exposure and risk. So clearly trying to protect what could be quite a vulnerable volunteer workforce. We could also see a lot of prohibition. And again, this quote was typical. Um, the policy was no volunteers. So you can see this early corporate steer no volunteers in the hospital. Clearly, there were lots of other people working in the hospital, nurses, doctors, other healthcare staff, but not volunteers. So volunteers were being treated very differently to the paid members of staff. We also asked about adaptations and what was changing. And actually we saw less of that than we had expected. We did write a paper around some of the general adaptations. We called it necessity is the mother of invention because we could see some very innovative changes happening across the palliative care field. But when it came to the questions about volunteers, surprisingly much less so. And surprising to me because the volunteer world is often one where there is change and innovation. But that seemed to have been, I guess, because the volunteers weren't around. They'd been told not to come in. So they, there wasn't that interaction. But there were some. So here's an example from the US where they actually had their volunteers manning the phones, you know, calling individuals, doing a check in, bridging the gap. But actually, much less of that than you might have expected. That was in 2020, clearly right at the very beginning of the pandemic. And obviously, we know that nearly three years in now, things have changed. So the last piece of research I'm going to talk about before I talk about my challenges for the future is actually some work that literally has only come out earlier this week. This paper has been out about four days now, I think. So it is truly hot off the press. But it actually reflects some work I did with the EAPC Volunteer Task Force, the European Association of Palliative Care, because we were asking ourselves the question, what has changed? How have things changed as the pandemic has progressed? So we ran another survey approximately a year to 18 months after that first survey. So most of this data was collected in the middle of 2021. So again, uh, most of these countries were not in lockdown at that particular point in time. Most of the vaccination programs had uh, taken off. Uh, most people had had some vaccinations. Things were ch starting to change and shift. And so we thought, what is happening with volunteers as the pandemic is progressing. So here you can see the responses. And again, um, much less unsurprisingly, perhaps because it was a European generated survey, much less dependence on responses from the UK, um, lots from Western Europe. Again, these were organizations. So people were asked to respond on behalf of their organization, not as an individual. So uh, you can see the pattern of responses there. So quite European, unsurprisingly, because it was an EAP survey, but with a really good representation from across the world. So what did we find? We asked them to compare what was happening pre-pandemic to what was happening then in the middle of 2021. Sadly, we still found a pretty catastrophic decline. So in the blue in this spider plot is what was happening pre-pandemic. So you can see um, similarly to our previous survey, approximately 60% of organizations 
had direct patient facing volunteers. In the orange, you can see the percentage that had direct patient facing volunteers when we asked during COVID in 2021, just shy of 20%, a major decline. The whole of that graph has shrunk in. Um, virtually zero, still involved with other and fundraising. Some indirect, some back office, but generally still and absolutely still, I would say, pretty catastrophic uh, non-use of volunteers within those services. We asked them why and what was going on. And here you can see the categorization of uh, and the ranking in terms of the importance. And you can see number one there is still because we told them not to come in. So these organisations were still saying no to volunteers. And I think that policy response is actually really important to think about. Number two, there is still a consideration of vulnerability due to age or pre-existing conditions because of the cohort of volunteers that they typically had had involved with their services. Um, but And some saying they actually, I don't want to volunteer. I'm afraid of COVID-19. So you can see a range of things there, but still number one is actually because we as organisations are saying, no, don't come in. We don't want you here at the moment. We have concerns about having volunteers, often for some very good reasons. That's not a criticism, but it is to recognise that these are decisions that we are making in terms of volunteers. We could also ask them about the uh, typical age ranges of their volunteers within their services. And here you can see a shift. So you can see a shift in the change of volunteers across those age ranges, where there's a reduction in those who are over 50, particularly in the 71 to 80 range, which often are the back of many volunteering services and the start to, of a shift to seeing more younger volunteers. The overall number of volunteers has shrunk. So remember, this is in the context of a shrinking number of volunteers. But within that shrinking number of volunteers, there's a shift to a younger demographic. And again, that I think is important to uh, consider as we go through to the future. Again, this is a typical response. Scared of COVID, old, some are at risk. It's difficult to get going again. Some have used the shutdown as an opportunity to stop volunteering. So people are perhaps reappraising their priorities, thinking about what's important to them, thinking about whether they want to volunteer. So that encapsulates many of those changes. But it made a difference to the quality of the care. And they, you know, in the paper, if you want to read it, it's open access. You know, we present some more data about that shift and perceptions in terms of quality of care. But this is one of the sorts of comments that we get about the difference that the volunteers made to the staff, to the patients, about the impact on loneliness the filling in the voids, that making the space more lively and caring. Volunteers were considered to be an important and integral part of the palliative care community. And their absence has been really keenly felt. So I think now I want to turn my attention to looking forwards, to actually thinking about tomorrow and thinking about the future of volunteering as we face um, continuing to be facing what is unknown. I don't know what the future holds, none of us do. We are still being very much affected by the COVID-19 pandemic, albeit we are in a different place now than we were when some of these data were collected. 
And I'm sure if we went back and asked again, then we would hopefully see some shifts. But I think the pandemic has fundamentally altered some of the aspects of volunteering that we need to think about really carefully. So we know there are boulders in the way. We know that there are challenges ahead. But if we think about what those challenges are, then we're going to be pushing around boulder, which is an awful lot easier than trying to move one of my square boulders. So I have a number of challenges that I want to articulate to you. I don't necessarily have the answers to these challenges, but we need to work together as a sector and internationally to think about how we address these challenges. So my first challenge one is one of demography. We are seeing an acceleration of what was already happening. In the wider volunteering research, you can already see pre-pandemic these questions about this demographic shift in volunteering. And what COVID-19 has done is accelerate that. It's not a change, it's an acceleration. So we see younger volunteers, but younger volunteers have different skills to offer and different time to offer. They potentially need different training. They need different support. They need different roles. And we need to think about how we can integrate that in the way that we run and operate our services. Challenge two is about volunteer opportunities. We need to think about how we can offer more episodic volunteering where somebody might only come in occasionally or micro volunteering when they're offering a small amount of their time rather than perhaps a whole day or an afternoon or you know <coughs> three hours or something. We typically had volunteers for a longer period of time. So how can we harness their skills in that episodic and micro volunteering? We also see a shift in what people have called either constant volunteering or, or um, trigger volunteering or serial volunteering. They volunteer to do different things at different times. And we have to be flexible and think about how we manage that. And actually managing that is going to take time. Typically, the organisations that we surveyed had a volunteer manager who often had other hats. They were doing other things as well. But if we want to harness the power of volunteers, then we have to invest time in uh, managing these roles, uh, which will be different to what is happening currently. Challenge three is going to remain COVID. It isn't going away anytime soon. And however we might wish COVID away, we do have to think about the safety of our volunteers in the way that we think about the safety, I hope, of all of those who are within our organisations. Those challenges of vaccination, ventilation, masks, distancing are all going to continue to matter. And we're going to have to think about how we build that into some of our roles if we are going to assure as much as possible the safety of those who work alongside us and manage those risks appropriately. Challenge four is about role innovation. I've talked a little bit already about new roles, but we're really going to have to put our thinking caps on to think about how we are going to bring in those new roles for those new volunteers. The fifth challenge is actually about harnessing the power of our community. I don't know what it was like for you, but for us here in the UK, at the same time as we were seeing a catastrophic decline in organised volunteering, for example, within the palliative care sector, as I've already described, we also saw a huge increase in volunteering within the community. Certainly here where I live, every street had a WhatsApp group. 
The village I live in was leave no one behind on the Facebook group. People wanted to help. There was a groundswell of volunteers coming forwards to do things, a human response to what was happening. And that is in stark contrast to our organisational um, policies, which said no. So we've really got to think, I think, much more creatively about how we harness the power of our communities, how we work with that bottom up way of thinking about things. We already know a lot about compassionate communities and compassionate volunteering and compassionate cities. It's perhaps part of that, but we need to challenge ourselves as to how we're going to harness that power going forwards. And perhaps given my role now primarily as, as a researcher, unsurprisingly, my challenge six is that actually we need to evaluate what's happening much more. We need to do much more to evidence our impact. I started off by saying in our yesterdays, as the Beatles would say, that actually there's not a lot of evidence of impact. We have an intuitive understanding that volunteers are a good thing. As my statistician friend would say, the wind is blowing in the right direction. We don't think volunteers do harm. That's really important because I've been challenged by that by a research ethics committee in the past. But we can't actually say with any certainty that volunteers actually have the impact that we think they're going to have. So we need to, if we're exploring new ways and new ways of being volunteers, we need to accompany that with some robust research and evaluation. We need to understand what we should no longer do and disinvest in as much as thinking about what we could or should do in the future. That's really important. We need to build that in to everything we do. But volunteers, I think and I believe, I also have a volunteer role myself within a hospice, will remain important and have a lot to give. So I'm going to finish with a really well-known quote from one of the Beatles, John Lennon. I get by with a little help from my friends. We are a community in palliative care provision. Volunteers are an important part of that community that certainly over the first few years of the pandemic were sadly lacking. And so I challenge you to think about how we can change to move forwards so those friends, our volunteers, remain an important part of our service going forwards. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. And um, we'll go to Heike now to just give perhaps a perspective from Victoria and Australia, and then we'll have a look at some of the questions that have come in. Thank you, Heike. Thank you, Fiona, and thank you, Catherine. It was a fantastic presentation. And I can reassure you, the experiences and the evidence from the UK are very similar to the situation in Victoria and Australia-wide. In Victoria, we had a total of 2.3 million volunteers who contributed 58 billion in value to the economy. And in the palliative care sector, we had 2,000 volunteers pre-COVID. But the pandemic had a huge impact on volunteers, patients, clients, their families, and on leaders of volunteers and the palliative care services. So most of the programs were put on hold and the sector lost on average 30% of the volunteers. And as Catherine mentioned, it's the same reasons, you know, volunteers had underlying health issues or volunteers were scared or feared COVID-19. They wanted to start volunteering in a different sector with lesser restrictions because clearly they wanted to volunteer 
And it was so important for them and for the benefit of their mental health. Some went back to the workforce because of the nurse shortages. And we also saw the challenges for leaders of volunteers. Some were furloughed, some have been redeployed to new roles, and some resigned. The Leaders of Health Volunteer Engagement, the LAV Network, is providing a benchmark report over the past nine years. And their findings confirm the distinct decrease in volunteer participation, but they also highlight the immense support volunteers received from leaders of volunteers during the lockdown. And we also have evidence from Volunteering Australia, who has published landmark research presenting a full picture of volunteering in Australia and all states and territories did contribute to this research. The Volunteering in Australia 2022 reports provide an insight into why volunteering is declining and how we can address the challenges and explore opportunities to reimagine a future where volunteering in Australia can thrive. They also released volunteering research papers which aim to capture evidence on a wide range of topics related to volunteering and outline key insights for policy and practice. For example, the importance of strategic investment in volunteer leadership development. And in February 2023, Volunteering Australia will launch the National Strategy for Volunteering at the National Volunteering Conference in Canberra, which will help to shape the future of volunteering in Australia. So coming back to Victoria, currently the majority of volunteer programs in the palliative care sector are up and running again. Recruitment and training of prospective volunteers has started with new collaborations between palliative care services to facilitate induction trainings. And when we are looking into the future, so based on the evidence, but also from first-hand experiences and learnings, we can see new opportunities arising. And as Catherine has outlined, we need more diversity within the volunteer teams, like younger people, people from different cultural backgrounds, people from the LGBTIQ plus communities, and people with disabilities, which should be considered in the recruitment strategies. We also need more diversity within the volunteer roles and create more flexible volunteering roles, looking into more skilled volunteering opportunities or matching people better to different skills. Those opportunities are also reflected in the Victorian Volunteering Strategy 2022 to 2027, released by the Victorian government. It outlines a plan to improve support for volunteers and strengthen the volunteering sector. And they identified five goals. And the goals are making volunteering inclusive and accessible, making volunteering flexible and easier, supporting volunteers to be resilient, supported and empowered, creating volunteering connections and pathways, and ensuring volunteering is recognized and celebrated. So with all these insights and supports, and as Catherine said, with a little help from my friends, I think the future of volunteering across palliative care looks really promising. Thank you. Lovely. Um, 
We've got some questions that have come in, and, and I, my mind is just going around in circles here. I, I, I don't want most of the questions are coming in clearly around challenges, uh, which is where we all tend to take, take our minds. Um, but there has one one has come in around the research, and I think we might go with that one first, um, Catherine. And it was around the quality of life, mm -hmm. and. Um, that compelling slide you had that was um, showing that quality of life declined for people who didn't have volunteers. And the question really was around what was quality of life? Okay, so we How did you define different... that, I guess? Sorry, sorry, yeah. Okay, uh, well, I mean, we, uh, we used a very particular tool to measure quality of life, of which, of course, there are very many available to people. We used a tool called the Hoqual Breath. And the reason we used the tool called the Hoqual Breath, which is a very well known, highly validated uh, tool, was because A, it has been used in lots of different diseases. So it wasn't just, say, for example, a cancer specific quality of life tool. It was. It has also been translated, validated, has good psychometric properties in a range of languages. And we knew that um, we were going to be potentially sending these out to people for whom English was not their first language. And we wanted it available in a range of languages uh, uh, relevant to some of the geographies that we were working with. Um, and the Hoqual breath is a very broad quality of life measure that measures quality of life across four different domains, uh, you know, physical, psychological, spiritual, etc. So it's a it's a measure that looks at the breadth of of, of quality of life. So um, and actually the most important you, you look at it as a composite score, so you, you, you don't disaggregate it. But actually, the element that appeared to be contributing most to the, re, the, the, the amendment of the decline was actually the physical um, element of quality of life. But don't think of it. You'd, you'd have to look at the questions to really understand what that meant, because one of them was about getting out and about. And actually, of course, the, the volunteers were facilitating people getting out and about more. Um, so we think that's possibly what made some of that difference. So um, in other words, we're defining quality of life in the way that the tool defines quality of life as a very broad understanding. As I also hinted, we also measured loneliness and social support, which are, I guess, you, you know, intuitively part of quality of life. We didn't detect a difference in, in those specific measures. We only detected a difference in our overall quality of life measurement tool. Yeah, it's very interesting, isn't it? Because the, those kind of quality of life and, and impacting time of decline are the sort of things that interest policymakers and uh, organisations. So thank you for elaborating on that and thank you for the question in our chat here. Um, Again, I'll just stay with you, Catherine. The research that you, uh, some of the research that you were talking about was prior to the pandemic. Are there any plans to revisit um, your research sites um, with the same survey and see if things have changed and whether some of those challenges have been addressed? Uh, and I guess I'm interested in innovation. You know, what, what innovation yeah. are we seeing? And Heike, I'd like you to comment on that one as well. Yeah, uh, there aren't any plans at the moment. Um, I, I mean, I think one of the things one would have to think about is, you know, when one might do something like that. You, you know, obviously we did it, you know, we did it in 2020. We did it again in 2021. They were slightly different surveys. One of them was a part of a funded research project. The other one was from the EAPC Volunteering Task Force and, to be honest, was managed by a lot of people doing a lot of work in their spare time. So, as we know, quite a lot of research sometimes happens. Perhaps so, volunteering your own time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, and actually, uh, one of the authors was an absolutely fantastic uh, master's student. Um, who uh, did it? some of that as, as part of her master's project as well. So again, showing some of the innovation and flexibility perhaps that we have to use. So uh, the reality is no, there are no plans to do that again at the moment. 
But if anyone wants to take up the baton um, to perhaps do some of that work, I think it would be absolutely fascinating. I think there's some interesting questions about when you would do it and whether you might ask entirely the same, same questions. Um, because I think actually you'd want to probably explore much more about some of these potentially new roles and changes in in the types of people who are volunteering perhaps than we did. So I think in the way that we changed some of the questions from first to second uh, survey, I think there are some additional questions that one might want to ask learning from some of the answers of this survey. But the short answer is no, we don't have a plan at the moment. But if anyone wants to take up that baton, I think we'd be um, would be very interested. Heike, have you got a comment not on the well on the research piece? Is that something that Palliative Care Victoria might be interested in uh, <laughs> looking into? It's really quite interesting. And it will be also interesting for us, you know, we know what has or what has been in the past, what happened during COVID. And now we are all so excited that the programs are up and running. And we know about, you know, all the challenges coming up. And it would be interesting to see how can we measure what has changed? What are the new initiatives? What new volunteer roles or what new volunteer programs are coming out out of these learnings and experiences we had in the past? And I think it's a really good question because we should put something in place now that we can do a survey probably later on, maybe in one year time or in two years and really see what has changed and how successful have we been with the challenges and with the recruitment and with the creation of new roles. I will make a note. I put it on my list. <laughs> it's a really good question. Yeah. Uh, lovely. And this one, um, both of you may be able to comment on this. Uh, volunteering and concerns for volunteers primarily is driven by the coordinators. What evidence is there that those at the decision making levels have buy in to open the doors for volunteers further? How involved and interested are the CEOs and boards in this particular area of the workforce? Until they are, the comment is there will be no significant change. Yeah, I mean, to some extent, that's a little bit challenging for me to answer because, you know, the data that we have was primarily from the coordinators. You know, we were asking the managers and coordinators of the service to respond to the survey. So clearly they were the ones that were often making these decisions and demonstrating that sort of concern for the volunteers in a very, you know, um, lockdown sort of way. Um, I don't know what evidence there is that there is buy-in to open the doors to volunteers further. Um, <clears throat> the work on CEOs and boards is um, minimal. So I think all that there would be would be um, anecdotal evidence about that. Um, and in fact, I sit on a board of a hospice. So, <laughs> I, you know, I do have some anecdote um, potentially around that. I think there is some interest, but I think there's very little research. So, and and bearing in mind, certainly here in the UK, I don't know what it's like in Australia, the boards of charitable hospices are also volunteers. You know, that's one of my volunteer roles to sit on a board. So they ought to be interested because they are volunteering themselves, not perhaps the same in, some, you know, for example, in, in some of the other publicly funded um, bodies, but often it is a volunteer role. But I think it's part of our job to agitate, you know, CEOs and boards have a very wide remit. And unless we make volunteers more visible to the CEOs and the boards, they are not going to have buy in. They're not going to understand what needs to happen. So I would say the challenge is to us to make that visible to the CEOs and boards and think about how we can engage them in understanding uh, volunteering, volunteers and the challenges for the future. Um, Heike, have you got any particular response to that or we can move on? <laughs> 
Um, I would like to add something to it because in regards of the evidence, so when we saw it was really tricky at the beginning of um, 2022 to get um, palliative care service providers to open the doors for the volunteers again. But some organizations were really proactive. So the CEOs were quite supportive and did allow volunteers back at the early beginning of 2022. And um, as Palliative Care Victoria, you know, we did monitor the situation and we wanted to encourage other CEOs to make the same decisions and open up the programs. And what we did was an advocacy campaign. And we did ask those organizations who um, had the volunteers returned to write um, a little bit of a story for us and to document for us how have they done it. What did they have in place that volunteers could return in a really safe way with all the risk management boxes ticked? And so that's what happened every week in our news flash. We published these stories from organizations who have successfully returned the volunteers. And it was quite amazing to see, you know, the different sizes of organizations and the locations. So from Metro Melbourne, but also from regional Victoria, because everyone is operating in a different way. And with, I think after five or six stories, it was wonderful to see that all at a sudden, the majority of programs were back. So it did have a huge impact on other organizations and made probably CEOs and boards think of, okay, others have done it safely. So why can't we do it? So let's have a look at it and let the volunteers return. Yeah, look, that's a really interesting uh, advocacy point, isn't it? Because uh, we know that um, health, this is a comment that organisations, uh, we, we had, um, and the UK would have been the same, but many of these, na these were nationally, national policy decisions that organisations had to make around closing, you know, uh, access. But that reticence to open up, we know that um, it's often where, slow to innovate and and come back from and and so it's been it, that piece of advocacy i think would be very interesting for people to um uh, know about in broader across the sector uh, because that is very tangible information for other organizations to see why and how organizations were able to to safely uh, open up because i think predominantly this was around risk management these decisions um, another question, Heike, you spoke about more diversity is needed in the palliative care sector. Do either of you, Catherine or Heike, have any suggestions regarding how we can do this, both diversity in volunteers and the roles and tasks that they perhaps would undertake? Uh, I'm happy to get started on it. and. Uh... I need to refer to Catherine as well, because she mentioned already, when we are looking into um, getting more diverse volunteers and maybe attracting um, the younger volunteers as well, we really need to think about uh, the time we are asking from them, how flexible can we make volunteer roles? So that is really something that would attract younger volunteers. Or we also need to look more into what kind of skills can they offer and in which area. And it's really all about challenging um, the palliative care services to think about what new roles can you create for those volunteers. Or when we are thinking of people with a different cultural background, how can we make it you know, welcoming, give them a welcoming environment. How can we make the application process so much easier? Because we know, you know, people where English is the second language. Or 
filling out all these forms and maybe doing everything online might be not the way they want to go. And so we can't reach them. How can we make this connection? I think we really need to start with collaborating more with people from the uh, from different cultural backgrounds, people from the LGBTIQ plus communities and with organizations who are supporting people with disabilities. And I think that should be the first steps we could take. And we just need to do really lots of sharing of ideas and what is possible. What can we make possible to make access to volunteering easier and more flexible? And then we can see the success, I guess. Mm. I, I think I think to add to that, the whole question of um, equity in palliative care and palliative care provision is one which I think is being really highlighted at the moment and is a real challenge that we need to examine ourselves very carefully. Um, to put a slightly different hat on at the moment, we've published a few things in palliative medicine recently, including a fantastic editorial about um, questioning ourselves about um, how we might be racist in palliative care, not just palliative care, but generally, and how we bring our way of thinking um, in a, perhaps a way which is inappropriate. So I think my challenge is we certainly in the UK, we know that our services are not well designed uh, for people who are from minority ethnic groups. We know that these are not hard to reach services. They're services that we are not providing appropriate care for. And I think we need to absolutely go out into those communities and empower those communities from the bottom up. I think it's one of those challenges that I talked about. We shouldn't be doing for or reaching out to, but we should be an enabling and facilitating those communities um, and listening and listening and listening to what it is they want and really question ourselves. One of the interesting things that we found in one of those studies that I talked about is one of the areas was an area with very high minority ethnic population. And the organisation in a very equitable bottom up way put a lot of effort into working alongside that population and actually uh, engaged and brought in a lot of um, volunteers from minority ethnic communities and worked alongside them and trained them to be part of the befriending neighbor friend service that we were talking about it was absolutely fantastic to see the challenge was they wanted to support people. They volunteered to support people often from their own communities, although they're obviously much more flexible than that. And people from those communities were not being referred into the hospice. So we had, or they had done a fantastic job of engaging with the community, understanding their challenges, being flexible in the way that they approached, really bottom up, empowering those communities, not doing for. But actually, to begin with, then members of those communities were not coming forwards for support. And again, that turned into a second piece of work, if you like, to actually try and understand that. So it is a real challenge for us. It's certainly a challenge for us here in the UK. And I think, you know, as Heike said, we need to think about it very differently and work alongside and with those communities, not do for those communities, because I think that's destined to fail. Thanks. Now, someone is offering some innovative models here for us to consider. Um, there'll be someone who's interested, Catherine, in your thoughts on the potential for student placements in palliative care volunteering. Mm 
Yeah, we we certainly saw from some of the responses that um, some uh, did have students volunteering, um, and we know from other research that uh, some organisations will have perhaps students who are on health and care pathways volunteering. Some of them have medical or nursing students volunteering. Um, I mean, I think that um, some of them have um, uh, school students or university students, so they don't have that health and care background volunteering as part of their sort of um, community engagement as part of their course. I think all of those are avenues that we need to explore, uh, but we need to recognise what that actually means. These are not people that are replacing the volunteer roles that we might not have anymore or the volunteers before. They will be bringing different skills, different experiences, different backgrounds, potentially into different roles. So I think, you know, we need to be broad and inclusive, but we need to think about what that actually means for our services. Um, so I think, you know, yeah, if you're if you're near a, you know, a big university or college and, uh, you know, often they will have quite large volunteering programs, we need to open those opportunities because otherwise people wouldn't necessarily be thinking about um you know hospices death and dying as a as a place to for, to be a very fulfilled volunteer um but actually i think that's really important and you know we're not here to talk about death literacy uh, generally but we know that it's relatively poor and this could be you know actually something that would be quite important as part of that so um I think that's great, but I think we have to go into it with our eyes open, knowing that this is different and we can't just take one model and say the students are going to fit our old model. We have to have new models and, and new thinking. But at the end of the day, whatever age you are, whatever background you are, volunteering in much of the data that I've been talking about is about that human connection. and whether you be young or old, you can make that human connection and, and be a, a supportive presence for somebody. Absolutely. Thank you. And for we uh, death, just touching back on death literacy, we one of our topics uh, earlier this year on our webinars was indeed around death literacy. So if anybody uh, may be able to see that still up on our website. Um, where are we going here now? There's many, many questions. Um, It's just, I don't, um, let's, um, this again, this is you, Catherine. It goes back to your research and note you use the term befriender when discussing interactions between volunteers and patients. And the question here is, was that a, was that a conscious decision to use that term or did, was that something that happened organically as the research uh, uh, unfolded? Uh, no, it was a conscious decision to use that because the uh, particular services that were set up were set up with that aim in mind. So we were testing out a very particular form of volunteering, which most of the services called befriending. I mean, some of them, they called the services all sorts of things, um, but that was uh, integral, I think, to uh, the type of service that was offering. So, you know, we weren't testing every home-based volunteer. We weren't trialing, you know, lots of different volunteer roles. We were absolutely trialing volunteers going to see people in their home or community setting with, um, the aim with a, a range of potential roles within that volunteering, but definitely with that befriending mode on. So, you know, most of them had um, a scope which was about being alongside people, spending time with people, helping them to get out and about, um, potentially doing some, um, you know, um, tasks, gardening or, you know, walking the dog or going shopping or, but most of the time we could see from the data, they were actually just spending time with each other. You know, they might have been playing board games or watching a film or something, but they were being alongside somebody or taking them out for coffee. Um, we also had a, a role which we called as part of that signposting, helping them to, um, potentially know about other services but in reality they weren't doing that we 
because we collected a lot of data on the rolls and that's not something that they were doing. Although we know, you know, from all the, the work research on lay navigation, that that can be an important role. So, um, you know, there is quite a lot of research about lay navigating uh, services, which we probably haven't got time to talk about now, and that's other people's work. Uh, but yeah, I use the word befriender because that's exactly what those services were that were um, funded to be part of the trial. Heike, is that a term that's used here in Australia? It's not some, not a term that I have heard myself, but um, I'm not across all the details of palliative care. No, it's not really a term we are using. I think it's a little bit uh, has something to do with, um, you know, the boundaries we are setting as well. If we're talking about befriending and maybe within the meaning becoming a friend of the patient, we really need to be careful because usually the volunteering role is only designed for a limited time, you know, clearly up until the death of the patient or the client. And we don't encourage, you know, um, a friendship with the family that might continue later on. Because you never know if you have a close friendship, if it comes to something like that. You know, there are lots of issues that can arise, especially things like that families can become really demanding. So we really need to make sure that we protect the volunteers as well, that we set boundaries. And that's why we are staying a little bit away of the term befriending. We are more like, um, some call their programs companionship programs or visiting programs or uh, support volunteers, things like that, but lesser the befriending term. Yeah. Yeah, and interesting, we've got um, a comment that's come in, uh, you know, just questioning are the boundaries around the volunteer client relationship too strict here in Australia there is generally a requirement to cease relationships once the role has concluded so uh, that you know you have essentially answered that question based around the current um, policy decisions um, one to for both of you that um, to look at is do when we, we we talked about all those challenges, um, but do you want to have some concluding suggestions regarding safeguarding the volunteer role within the palliative care sector? Um, we the palliative care staff and clearly um, clients and patients see the importance of that volunteer role, but often higher management or executives in organisations don't perhaps as much as other cohorts. Um, how can we change that? Well, I mean, I think I'd probably <laughs> um, say, given the, the hats that I currently uh, hold, that actually the evidence base is really important to changing that thinking. You know, we're increasingly talking about the evidence behind all of the decisions that we make. So, you know, evidence based policy making as well as evidence based practice. And if we want evidence based policy making and for volunteering to be part of those policy decisions and to be high on the policy agenda, both within organizations and also more broadly, then, you know, those policy makers, organizations, CEOs, boards, whatever, are going to ask for the evidence. You know, we can't just wheel up and say we think volunteering's great, you know, invest in it. We actually have to have the evidence to support that. And we know that there is less evidence about volunteering <coughs> pardon, than there are about lots of other aspects of palliative care. So we need to build that evidence base. We need to invest in evaluation and research. And that's not always about massive, great, big funded studies, but it's actually about having that evaluation head on, you know, when you're running a pilot or you're trying something new, you know, collecting good data to actually inform those choices in the future. Clearly evidence is not the 
only answer. We know lots of things that are evidence based that don't happen in practice. But I think they're a really important starting point to be able to argue your case and argue your corner, because actually showing effectiveness, cost effectiveness and benefit to the patient, the family and the organisation is hugely persuasive. Absolutely. I totally agree to everything that Catherine has said. And especially, we know about the impact volunteers have. And we did see, you know, with the lockdowns, um, a lot of nurses and health professionals, they did tell us how much they miss the volunteers because clearly they could see without the volunteers, what did happen during the lockdown. And we knew about the nurse shortages and all the difficult situations everyone had to deal with. So we know the impact of the volunteers is massive and families and carers clearly benefit from volunteers. Also do um, the health professionals, the services with the time volunteers can spend. And it's also, we did see, you know, a lot of um, service providers did safeguard their volunteers very, very well. And so others can learn from that. And that's what we need to see. And we always advocate anyway for integrating volunteers within staff policies as well. I think that's something people just need to consider because really you should treat them more or less in the same way. Yes, we need to acknowledge the difference between staff and volunteers, but there should be policies in place that are really for both paid and unpaid staff. Well, look, thank you. Both of you have, have, uh, have really given us some compelling evidence and, and advocacy work already that we will be able to draw upon as with um, our palliative care organisations across um, certainly in Australia. I want to thank you both um, and I'm, the amount of questions that I haven't been able to answer is testament to uh, the interest. Um, Thank you for everyone to enjoying uh, joining us today and uh, all the best with the rest of your 2022. Uh, this webinar will be available uh, up on our website in the coming days. Give us a few days, but uh, you'll be able to access it and uh, all those wonderful slides and um, uh, evidence um, articles that uh, Catherine has provided for us. As I said, I wish you all the very best for the rest of 2022 and we will see you for a next round of events uh, in 2023. Thank you.